Did we get all of that on video? Because I'd like to play it back and watch it for my own personal satisfaction. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. If you remember last time I was here in the fall when we did this evening lecture, we just watched a TV show together and talked about it. And Jeff didn't think that was sufficiently rigorous. So I have to actually lecture. And so that's what I'm going to do. This is called Some Notes on the New Moralism. And Jeff has already lodged an objection to the title, which he doesn't find exciting enough. But uh, there's a reason why it is what it is. Uh, notes on the new moralism would suggest that this is kind of preliminary thoughts. <laughs> would suggest it's just preliminary thoughts. Some notes suggest it's really preliminary, and that's what it is. This is kind of a, a work in progress. It's some thoughts that I've been thinking through uh, for like 20 years and trying to put some things together. So we're going to be thinking about moralism together. Does anybody know what moralism is, by the way? It never hurts to define your terms. Uh, you know what morality is? Anybody want to hazard a definition? What is morality? Anybody? Yeah. yeah, I think so. What's morality? Come on, you guys know. <laughs> Cody? There's also. Um, oh. <laughs> morality is basically a person's morality is the standard by which they rule things right or wrong. Okay, yeah, so our beliefs about what's right and what's wrong. I mean, that's morality. When we talk about moral issues, you know, we talk about questions of, of right behavior, wrong behavior. But if you put an ism on the end of that, moralism, we're talking about something a little bit beyond just simple right and wrong. We're talking about um, not, not the idea of being saved by being moral, but certainly uh, judging whether or not we're good people based on whether we follow the right code, like whether we embrace the right moral code. So what we're going to be talking about is the way that that moralism, the way that our beliefs and moral codes are evolving right now. And I think we're in the midst of a big change. Now, 20 years ago, long before I met Jeff Baldwin and the whole course of my life changed, I was in grad school studying creative writing. And Jeff forces you, those of you who are in his literature classes, to discern the themes of work. Well, those themes aren't random. Like the themes are put there by authors. And the problem is when you're going to school to learn how to be an author, they have to fill your head not just with like how to write, but also how to think about ideas so that you can have themes to write about. So in addition to taking writing workshops, we have to take a class called Modern Thought. And Modern Thought, they could have just called this Introduction to Nietzsche, and it would have been the same. Because Nietzsche was the one philosopher that we really talked about. And if you know anything about Nietzsche, you know that what Nietzsche was concerned about was the need for us to get beyond good and evil. So Friedrich Nietzsche, a uh, little bit of information. There he is, Friedrich Nietzsche. He had a formidable mustache, which helps distinguish him as a philosopher. He lived in the late 1800s. He lived at a time that, that you might think of as like the waning days of Christendom society, a Western society, European society, still identified itself as Christian, but what people meant by that was beginning to shift. And Nietzsche was one of the first philosophers who said, basically, we need to jettison Christian morality. We need to get beyond good and evil as they are understood by Christianity. Now, there had been people before who rejected the idea of the Christian God. That wasn't new. It wasn't knew to be skeptical about the claims of the Bible or anything like that. But there had been an interesting process in philosophy where people were trying to basically get rid of the God of the Bible, but retain the morality of the Bible. And Nietzsche saw that, he was not happy with it at all. There's a philosopher named Terry Eagleton who's written about the importance of Nietzsche. And what he has to say is interesting because he puts his finger on what Nietzsche's problem was. The reason why Nietzsche thought we needed to get beyond good and evil was essentially that all of philosophy was attempting to find a substitute for God so that it could get rid of God but keep all of the benefits 
that we get as a result. So here's what he writes. He says, the history of the modern age is, among other things, the search for a viceroy for God. So something, some idea that can rule in place of God and keep the system going. He says, as long as God's shoes have been filled by reason, art, culture, geist, which is German for spirit, uh, imagination, the nation, humanity, the state, the people, society, morality, or some other such specious surrogate, the supreme being is not quite dead. He may be mortally sick, but he has delegated his affairs to one envoy or another, part of whose task is to convince men and women that there is no cause for alarm, that business will be conducted as usual despite the absence of the proprietor. So yes, as Nietzsche says famously, God is dead, but the philosophers are telling you that's okay because in God's place we have reason, or art, or geist, or imagination, or the nation, the state, whatever. We have something that we can put in God's place so that the house of cards doesn't have to fall. You get the idea. You've seen um, the first Indiana Jones movie. Do you remember the way that opens? There's a, a scene where Indy wants to steal the golden idol. But he knows it's going to trigger a trap if he removes the weight. So what he does is he fills a bag of sand with the approximate weight of the little idol that he wants to remove. And he just kind of jogs the idol over and puts the sand in its place. So what Indy's trying to do here is exactly what philosophers have been trying to do, according to Nietzsche. They've been trying to fill the sand, or fill the bag full of sand, to approximate the weight of God, so that we can get rid of him without triggering the booby traps. Now think about what those booby traps would be, and what is the fear that leads people to want to get rid of God but keep everything else in place. When they're fearing like a breakdown in morality, right? that you can't be good without God. So we don't want people to stop being good. We don't want there to be anarchy in the streets. So we have to tell people, yeah, there's no God, but there's no reason to change the way you live your everyday life. So that's the thing Nietzsche has a problem with. It's dishonest. He's like, God is dead, we have killed him, and we need to kind of grow up and realize this and discover like a new good and evil. He wants to get beyond good and evil as a Christian idea and find some other kind of morality to put in its place. So this is Eagleton again. He says, what Nietzsche recognizes is that you can only get rid of God, or you can get rid of God only if you also do away with innate meaning. The idea that, that creation is meaningful, that it matters what we do, that our choices have moral implications, that's what we're trying to preserve by replacing God with some kind of a substitute. Nietzsche's the first guy to come along and say, you know what, if we lose that, maybe that's okay. You know, why don't we just sweep it all up? Our conceptions of truth, virtue, identity, and autonomy, our sense of history as shapely and coherent, all have deep-seated theological roots. It is idle to imagine that they could be torn from these origins and remain intact. Morality must therefore either rethink itself from the ground up or live on in the chronic bad faith of appealing to sources it knows to be spurious. So that's the choice. Either we're going to rethink morality entirely and come up with something new, or we're going to continue in this bad faith way, just dishonestly pretending like reason is a goddess that we can worship and that it's okay for us to basically continue to live as if Christianity were true while denying the God of Christianity's existence. You get the idea. Nietzsche wants to do away with all of that stuff. Now, there's a fear that a lot of us have had, a lot of Christians have had, that if something like this were to happen, it would really be the end of morality. So, when we think about Uh, this is actually something good, so back up a little bit. So the consequences of this, you heard the term modernism and postmodernism. I don't want to get too deeply into this idea, but I just want you to see that there's a shift between these two ideas. So modernism, you might associate that with the early 20th century. Modernism is, um, there's a kind of atheism in modernism, but it's a very strident atheism. It's sort of like aggressively against the idea of God. And you get a sense, too, that God is more powerful and has the upper hand. That uh, there's a, a sort of nihilism that we have to embrace if we get rid of God. 
So when you read modernist books that are atheistic, they're also really dark and pessimistic. They're sort of an embrace of this idea that we got rid of God, and now the world we live in is meaningless. But as we shift into postmodernism, that idea that, that there's something really dark and depressing about a meaningless world fades away. And it becomes easier to do away with the idea of meaning. Uh, Eagleton describes it this way. He says, whereas modernism experiences the death of God as a trauma, an affront, a source of anguish or a celebration, postmodernism does not experience it at all. According to Eagleton, and I think he's right about this, Nietzsche is the first truly atheistic philosopher, but his thought does not result in the first truly atheistic society. Look, he's a thinker who has a lot of influence, but he's still living in a world where people accept the ideas of Christendom. But what's happened is, over the course of a hundred uh, years, those ideas that were very and fringe in Nietzsche's day have become much more mainstream. So that the generation we live in, which I realize I'm older than a lot of you, and it may seem strange that I think we live in the same generation, but, but the generations that we have lived in are the first to kind of inherit the legacy of sort of this popular atheism, where really most of us have grown up in a world that takes as the default position the non-existence of God. Right? So if you're a person who believes there's a God, the burden of proof is on you. Right? You've got to show like, why you would believe such a thing, why you would have these ideas. Whereas it used to be the case in Nietzsche's age, if you didn't believe in God, the burden of proof was on you. So the assumptions have shifted in culture. And that's pretty significant. It's like the age has caught up with the philosophers. And now we're kind of living in this uh, post-Christian world where Christian ideas of good and evil have been superseded. And the question is superseded by what? Superseded by what? Christian ideas don't have the, the traction that they did. They've been replaced. But what by? This probably won't be true for a lot of you, but for me, growing up, probably the greatest fear that we had in, in church was the idea that our society was becoming less Christian. We thought that we had lived in a Christian country, a Christian culture, and now it seemed like that was shifting. And the idea of what that would look like, like what would the world look like after Christianity, was scary. I mean, it was, it was kind of frightening. Um, this is not from my own childhood. This actually goes back a little bit further, but this is a, a painting by Peter Bruegel, the elder, called The Triumph of Death. It kind of envisions this apocalyptic world where the gates have been opened and death surges in. And I don't know if you can make out the details, but it's basically a skeleton army coming in and chopping people up. And if you scrutinize it closely, there are all sorts of little horrors in each corner. And this is only a, a detail of a larger carnage going on all around. And to be honest, this was the kind of thing that, that we imagined, that we feared that if you took away Christian morality, what you were replacing it with was no morality. So the world was going to get increasingly worse and worse. Anything would be acceptable. Anarchy would reign. But let me ask you, does that sound like an accurate representation of the world that you live in? Like, can you do anything you want and get away with it? No. Not at all. I mean, there are still rules that you have to follow. It's still possible for you to do things that, that everyone turns on you for. Right? Um, so it's not that we now live in a world where you can do anything that you want. It's that the morality has shifted. So we're beyond one kind of good and evil, but they've been replaced by another kind of good and evil. There are new rules that we are expected to follow. So we haven't like grown into a world where there are no rules. We've grown into a world where there are different rules that we don't always understand because they're not the rules that we found in Scripture. Do you guys remember when I was here in the fall and I introduced you to our friend Michelle Hulbeck? Blank stares. No. Um, we won't go through this entire quote because we did it before, but it's so good that, that I love the idea. This is the one where he talks about the idea of metaphysical mutation. 
He says that uh, Christianity was a big idea that, that replaced and conquered Rome, not because Rome was in decline, but because Rome was like in its, in its greatest strength, but the new idea had come along, and it just couldn't fight against Christianity. And then the same thing happened to Christianity. Christianity was at its zenith. It was a complete worldview. It could explain everything. It was at its most powerful, and then suddenly a new idea came along, and Christianity couldn't stand against it. He describes these, these changes as metaphysical mutations. And mutation is the language of like, genetics. Right? It's, it's not the war of ideas that he's talking about, which is often how we think things change. Right? We think that everybody does their due diligence, they study their philosophy, and they decide, you know what, we should all be postmodernists because that makes the most sense of the world. And then somebody comes along and says, no, no, we should be post-postmodernists. That's totally better and more true. And then everyone evaluates the ideas and changes. He says, no, that's not how it works at all. Ideas don't change in that rational kind of way. They change the way fashion changes. The ideas go out of fashion and new ideas become trendy. So think about this. When we go online and something becomes really popular, what do we say has happened to that? Like if, let's say we had made a video today of Jeff Baldwin cuddling a cute puppy. We put it online, and it got 5 million hits overnight. What would that have gone? Gone viral. It would have gone viral. It's probably the only context in which you want to be viral. Right? Typically, if, if you, get, you get a virus that's bad, and you go to the hospital. But we talk about the spread of ideas, the popularity of ideas, in the language of disease. Right, the idea that the diseases spread like the plague, and you want to have that kind of popularity that everybody's catching your ideas. This is a completely different way of talking about the life of the mind than, than the idea that you find in the great conversation. Like None of the, the ancient philosophers are talking about uh, truth and beauty it, like it's a disease. And like you get one kind of sickness and then you succumb to another and all of that. No. So we've gone through a period where we've completely changed the way we think about why we believe what we believe. And I think this induces a lot of fear. Right? Because if ideas don't change based on their merit, that means we could be going anywhere. That means you could be totally right, but find yourself condemned by everyone else around you. It doesn't matter if your ideas are true. You could still find yourself under attack because your ideas have gone out of fashion. Are you familiar with uh, the play A Man for All Seasons? So A Man for All Seasons, okay, so I'm going to rent the movie or something and watch it. It's, uh, it's a play from the 20th century, the modernist period. But it's about uh, a guy, Sir Thomas More, the guy who wrote Utopia. And he's the one guy in England who will not sign on to Henry VIII's uh, remarriage, his divorce and remarriage. But he refuses to make a statement about it. But he, he maintains his silence, the idea being that if he never makes a statement, that he has a sort of personal integrity and he cannot be condemned because he hasn't said one way or the other. But even in his silence, he's singled out and he's condemned. Now, if you watch the movie, he is considered a hero. Like the one man who's willing to go against everybody else's ideas and, and buck the conventions of society. Like no one will stand up to the game but this guy. He's a modernist hero, the individual. I'm not sure if he would be a hero to us today, though. Because if you think about people in our society who are like that, people who deny what most everybody else believes, those people are kooks and crazy. Like, we don't give them the time of day. If you don't believe what everybody believes, you're an outlier, and that's not a good thing. No one looks up to you because of that. And I think that's a shift. Like, we don't value individualism as much as we did once. Now, we, we want to conform to the rules that are being imposed on us. So ideas aren't refuted, they're replaced. Now, the guy who preaches a sermon like the law of God in an increasingly lawless society probably buys into the idea that the old morality, the old moralism is being replaced, but it's being replaced by no morality. But hopefully we've talked about this enough to where you can see that's not what's going on. Like we don't live in a culture as Christians where good and evil are just being 
uh, or let's say good, is being swept aside and replaced by evil, what's happening is good and evil are being redefined. So you're still expected to be a good person. It's just that the things that make you good are totally different than what they used to be, and totally different than what you would expect if your ideas of morality came from the Bible. So let's talk about what the new rules are, the new morals. What, what is the nature of the new moralism and how does it work? I think, for me, this has been the hardest part to get my head around. Like, I get the idea that there are rules. I get the idea that if you transgress them, like if you hold to wrong beliefs and you make the mistake of tweeting about them, everyone will sort of pile on top of you. But it's hard to understand sometimes the passion behind that. Like, why do people who don't believe in, in absolute right and wrong get so passionate about people saying the wrong thing or, or suggesting that they have slightly less evolved views on whatever the important issues are? Why is there so much passion about issues that used to be relatively minor? I never really understood why there was so much heat in these arguments until, why are you laughing? So sorry. Yeah, I know. It's tough. It's hard to be me. Um, okay, so I read a book recently by this guy, uh, Joseph Bottom. Is it? Are you laughing at Joey? Joey, because of his hair. I don't even find these guys with these names. I mean, all of these names. This guy's like a, a Christian public intellectual. Right. Yeah. Right. Public. And, yeah. <laughs> Jeff doesn't believe in anything he hasn't heard of before. I don't know if you've noticed this, but. Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard, but I think if we lift him up in prayer for long enough, it might be going to change. All right, so uh, I heard this guy speak, and I, I read his book, and I, I, I decided I felt like he had a handle on something that I had never really understood, which is why people treat what, what are really very sort of irreligious or unreligious ideas as if they're the highest things. Um, they get really passionate as if it were a religious question. So, the way Joseph Bottom describes it, he says, the new moralism is a social gospel without the gospel, in which the sole proof of redemption is the holding of a proper sense of social ills. In the early 20th century, something called the social gospel emerged. If you're familiar with uh, the book In His Steps, have you ever had to read that Charles Sheldon book? Really? Okay. So anyway, uh, you know, people would wear bracelets to say, what would Jesus do, WWJD? That comes from this book. And it was written essentially at this time when this idea of the social gospel was emerging. That the problem with Christianity was it was all about like worshiping God and church, and it wasn't about fixing society. And so in the book, this group of Christians discovers, hey, we ought to go out and, and actually change the world. And so that's what they do. And they do it by asking themselves the question that their pastor poses, what would Jesus do? And so suddenly, you weren't really a good Christian anymore unless you were out there fighting these social ills. Now, what Joseph Bottom says is there was a transformation during the 20th century where that idea of my righteousness being tied up in the way that I battle against social evils, that that was preserved, but that the whole like gospel part of the social gospel got lost. So... The new moralism is basically like half of liberal Protestantism without the, the gospel part. So take the Bible out, but, but keep the, uh, the social work in. In their view, he says, the social forces of bigotry, power, corruption, mass opinion, militarism, and oppression are the constant themes of history. These horrors have a palpable, almost metaphysical presence in the world. They believe the best way to know themselves as moral is to define themselves in opposition to such bigotry and oppression, understanding good and evil not primarily in terms of personal behavior, but as states of mind about the social condition. So think about it this way. If you were going to be a good person, a moral person, 50, 60 years ago, the way that you would show people your morality is by the things you didn't do. You were not caught in the wrong places. You were not in the, the seedy dives and that sort of thing. You didn't mix with the wrong kind of people. You lived a, a morally upright life that looked very righteous, at least externally. 
And that's the way you show people that you were very good. So if you imagine kind of the cliche of, of uh, like a church service on a Sunday morning where everybody is dressed up in their best and, and they come in and everyone pretends like we're all here because we're righteous, not because we're sinners and need embrace. That's, that's the idea. That's the way we used to show that we were moral people by looking good personally, by not having vices, right? not doing stuff that was considered uh, a vice. But that's not really the case anymore. Right? We don't judge morality based on like personal behavior so much as we do by your your view of of social concerns. Right? So it's really important when something bad happens in the world that we all weigh in and show that we condemn it. I'm always fascinated when there's like a massacre of people somewhere in say the Middle East. And then you see in the news reports uh, oh, you know, the government of the United States has issued a report strongly condemning this act of mass murder. And I always think, like, like was, were people in doubt? Like, were we worried? Well, maybe the U.S. does approve of mass murder, so fortunately we've got a press release out showing that we strongly condemn it. No, I mean, I would kind of assume we were all against that. But the point isn't to clarify whether or not we're in favor of mass murder. The point is to show that we condemn things. The, the, basically, the point is to communicate the ideas that we hate. Do you know what the solution to most of our social problems is? Like, if there was one thing that we could do that, that would alleviate so many of the concerns that we have in the modern world, what would that thing be? There's something we need to raise. If we just raise this one thing, a lot of bad stuff would go away. What is it? What must we raise? Do you know, Jeff? Awareness. Awareness. But you're constantly hearing this any time Something bad is going on, whether it's a mass murder, whether it's the destruction of the environment. The thing we need to do is raise awareness about it. And the idea is that if more people believe, like more people see the wrongness of something, that that ill, whatever it is, will, will go away if we raise awareness. And what that means is the solution to our problems is education. Right? Whatever the problem is, the solution is to educate our way out of it. And the reason we do bad things is because we're not aware. We don't hold the right views of social ills. Now, I don't know about you, but to me this feels a little thin. Like, I don't feel like it's, it's saying much to just sort of weigh in and give a right opinion about something. If people are dying and I let you know on my, my Twitter feed that I'm against that, has it cost me anything? Have I taken some big moral stance? No. No. All I've really done is shown, like, like, I'm aligning myself with people who have the right awareness, the right social consciousness. And so I haven't really done anything, but what I have done is I've made myself feel righteous. I've helped so that I can understand myself as a good person. I can feel good when I have a proper awareness. So that's, that's the religious component to the new moralism his finger on. This, I think, is fascinating. So I, I said earlier that um, the way you used to show that you're a good person is, is through personal behavior, right? that there are certain things you wouldn't do. Well, there's been a shift in the kind of behavior that matters. And the way that the bottom puts it, I think, is fascinating. He says there's been a transfer of the moral center of human worry about the body away from sex and onto food. Right, so it used to be the case that if you were a good person, right, that could be expressed through sexual ethics, right, that you were, you were correct sexually. But now what matters is food. Right? You're a good person if you eat the right things. Like if you eat things that are organic, that are sustainably made, that sort of thing, then that makes you a good person. So when Jeff, who's been my personal chef this week, made me an omelet, using eggs that came from the chicken in the backyard. Chickens that had been fed by the rhubarb that he grows on just on the other side of the cage from the chickens. I felt good. I felt like a moral person because I was consuming like, like organic raw ingredients made by a person known to me like before my very eyes and then consumed. Like, like the chickens were there. I could see them as I ate their eggs. And that just gave me a sense of, of wellness and, and, and wholeness. Unfortunately, the chickens haven't been laying enough eggs, and so 
today I had to, to eat store-bought eggs, and I didn't feel as good. And to be honest, I didn't feel as good about Jeff either. <laughs> a person who would like serve store-bought chicken eggs, probably from a chicken factory, genetically modified chickens, and get the idea, like, this stuff matters to people in a way that it never mattered before. Like, people used to eat stuff, and all they cared about was, did it taste good? And now you could find yourself in a situation where, like, if it tasted bad, but you knew where it came from, and it, it came from an ethical source, that's what matters. That's a huge moral shift that would be almost incomprehensible to people living in times earlier than ours. And yet, so many of us buy into this. I mean, I, I doubt there are many of us who are, who are unaffected by it. Like, even those of us who mock it, like me, still, Jeff was giving me a hard time. Like, I'm a member of a co-op. I know my co-op membership number by heart, which is kind of embarrassing. But this is the culture we live in, right? We're products of this culture. Our, our moral concerns have shifted. Some more changes. Huck's going to hate this stuff. Because I, I, I got the impression Huck's not being on socialism and big government. Well, it turns out, according to Bottom, uh, the new moralists prefer that government, rather than private associations, such as intact families or churches they left behind, address social concerns. They remain puritanical and highly judgmental, at least about health, and like all Puritans, they are willing to use law to compel behavior they think right. Nonetheless, they do not see themselves as Puritan, for they understand Puritanism is concerned essentially with sexual repression. They have almost entirely removed sexuality from the realm of human action that might be judged morally. It's wrong to make moral judgment about anybody's sexual identity or choices. That's totally beyond the pale. right? And that's something, honestly, I mean, even if you you think there are moral implications to human sexuality, you probably don't go around telling everybody that. You're very circumspect who you talk to, because you know that if you talk about that stuff too openly, you're going to get some pushback, right, because of the culture that you live in. But the thing about it is, even though all this stuff is off the table morally, there's all this other stuff that's still on the table. It's been replaced by something else. But because we associate this sort of moralism and this, this uh, prissy moral judgment with just one area of law. It's like it gets us off the hook. So the reality is we're surrounded by people who are highly moralistic, uh, very sort of radical fundamentalists, but not in a religious sense. They have a different kind of moral sensibility, but it's just as strict, just as strident as the old one. So Bottom says that sin appears as a social fact, and the redeemed personality becomes confident of its own salvation by being aware of that fact, by knowing about and rejecting the evil that darkens society. So all you need to be saved in this kind of an economy is to basically see things the right way. If you recognize what's bad socially, if you're on the right side, then you're one of the redeemed. From a biblical point of view, that seems silly. Like it seems really slight. But it does explain why people are so passionate about this stuff. Right? Because if all salvation rests on whether or not the eggs that I ate came from a chicken in the yard or from a factory, genetically modified chicken, you better believe I'm going to be passionate about where eggs come from. Right? Because my salvation depends on it, or, or as close to salvation as I'm willing to go. Depends on it, my sense of my own righteousness. So it helps to understand why people are so up in arms about things that may seem to you like they're insignificant. There's another shift that's taking place that um, I think is going hand in hand. And it has to do with a shift from guilt to shame. Don't feel guilty, be ashamed. You think about the way that culture works and the way that, that we enforce the rules that we have. The way that we enforce rules has changed. The way that we do this in culture has changed. If you say the wrong things in public, if you hold to beliefs that aren't considered the right beliefs, you are publicly shamed. I mentioned Twitter earlier, and this is a phenomenon that you see happen a lot, right? People get on Twitter, 
and they start making what they think are humorous remarks, but then people pounce on those remarks, and suddenly it goes viral, and everyone is convinced that the person who said this is a bad person, and they basically need to be run out of the universe on a rail. There's a, an article that was in, I think, The New Yorker recently by John Ronson, uh, who's written a book about this. Uh, it's kind of a humorous book. It's called So You've Been Publicly Shamed. And it's a chronicle of all of these people over the last few years who have tweeted unwisely and then had to face the wrath. So you tweeted something that was in poor taste, and your whole life was turned upside down. People have lost their jobs. People have been ostracized. They've gone into hiding change their names, their identities, because as a result of some mistake that they made, they felt like all of society was turned against them. What's interesting about that phenomenon, though, is not that people make mistakes in public or say the wrong things. And we all do that. What's strange is the, the zeal that everybody else has in piling on. Right? We're all human beings. We all know that we're not perfect. We all know that we make mistakes. But once somebody gets singled out, as an object of scorn, like it is okay to, to have contempt for this person, it's almost like a modern day repeat of like stoning, right? or putting people in the stocks and, and throwing rotten vegetables at them. We really go after these people and try to destroy them. I think the reason for that in part is that the, the basis of our morality has shifted from, from a focus on guilt to a focus on shame. Is a novelist named Stephen Pressfield, who, in a, a really odd and, and interesting book called The Warrior Ethos, tries to uh, basically take the ancient Spartans and come up with life lessons from the culture of the Spartans. So, as you can imagine, some of these lessons are a little bleak. But one of the things that he gets into that I find fascinating is the difference between cultures that are based on guilt and cultures that are based on shame. So there's two kinds of cultures that sociologists recognize. And guilt-based cultures, like, like Western Christendom, work in an entirely different way than a shame-based culture like ancient Sparta or feudal Japan, somewhere like that. So listen to what he says. Individuals in a guilt-based culture internalize their society's conceptions of right and wrong. The sinner feels his crime in his guts. He doesn't need anyone to convict him and sentence him. He convicts and sentences himself. The West is a guilt-based culture. Since the Judeo-Christian God sees and knows our private deeds and innermost thoughts, we are always guilty of something with no way out save some form of divine absolution, forgiveness, or grace. Now, Stephen Pressfield's not a Christian author. He's not saying this because he thinks it's a good idea. He actually thinks it's a bad idea. We've got to be more like the Spartans. They didn't care about guilt. All they cared about was shame. Because shame works completely differently. It doesn't matter if, if you feel bad or not about what you've done. It doesn't matter if what you've done is objectively wrong or not. What matters is what your fellow tribe thinks about what you've done. So you can do terrible things, but if people approve of what you've done, that's all that matters. So in a shame-based culture, face is everything. You know, about, uh, have you heard the term saving face? Right? You don't want to back somebody into a corner. You want to give them an opportunity uh, basically to preserve their pride. So in a shame-based culture, face is everything. All that matters is what the community believes of us. If we have committed murder, we can, but we can convince our fellows that we're innocent, we're home free. On the other hand, if the community believes evil of us, even if we're blameless, we have lost face and honor. Death has become preferable to life. The community imposes its code on its members by such acts as shunning and public shaming. So the way that you see people behaving more and more in our society fits this kind of model. Right? It's not a question of whether you feel inside that what you've done is bad and so you repent of that. But rather it's what does society think? And if society condemns what you do and shames you, shuns you, publicly lambasts you, then you feel terrible. But if you can convince people that you're a good person, then you can get away with anything. You see the difference? I mean, in a guilt-based culture, I know when we talk about um, guilt, usually we talk about it in the negative. Right? We're constantly trying to reassure ourselves, not feel guilty about stuff. 
when you feel guilty, when it has a corrosive effect, that kind of thing. But if you compare these two ideas, you can see that, that in a guilt-based culture, an individual can actually come to a sense of repentance, can actually feel, if you're dealing with the Christian God that Pressfield dislikes, that you have to repent, because you can't get away with what's wrong. In a shame-based culture, you can absolutely get away with what's wrong, because morality is defined, basically, by the community and whatever its ideals are. So when you find yourself as a person who's been raised in, in a guilt-based culture, Christianity, but you're suddenly living in a shame-based culture, it's no surprise that there would be a kind of incoherence, that as Christians we would find ourselves feeling uh, more like strangers in a strange land than we've ever felt before. The other thing is, the way persuasion functions in this kind of culture is really different. When we talk about apologetics, we spend a lot of time working on arguments to try to persuade, to win people over. But we study logic so that we can walk people through a process, a sort of rational process, to help them see what the truth is. And in the kind of culture we think we're living in, that's a very great way to operate. But in a shame-based culture, that's not how things work. Like, no one is going to come to you and say, look, we know you think differently than we do, but let's reason together and find out who's right. Instead, when we figure out that you think differently than we do, we all pile on and shame you into conformity. And so you see what's going on is, is, is different. You're never given an opportunity to defend yourself because you're questioning an orthodoxy that you're not meant to question. You're meant to toe the moral line. So... The last question I want to think about is this. Like, what's the answer to all this? I mean, if we do live in a world that has shifted, if the, the rules of good and evil have changed, and if the way that those rules have been enforced has changed as well, so that it's, it's really difficult even to, to argue for a different system or a different morality, what do you do? I mean, how do you function in that kind of a world? So what's the answer to the new moralism? Well, I think that the answer to the new moralism is the same as the answer to the old moralism. I think one of the problems that we have, when we look at, at the history of ideas and, and changing ideas, is we imagine that the, that the challenges we face are unprecedented, and that we need some, some new strategy to try to overcome them. As a result of this, if you're thinking about uh, the way, for example, the Christian church has tried to address changing ideas over time, what it results in is the church constantly trying to reinvent itself, right? constantly changing, renewing its language, rediscovering uh, older language, trying to adapt itself to whatever the new regime is. So one kind of morality is superseded by another, and we try to figure out how to catch up, how to remain relevant in a world where the rules have all changed. But what I want to suggest is that rather than trying to develop new strategies to function in, in this changing world, that maybe there's always only ever been one answer to all of this. That we don't need to look very far to understand what the answer to this new challenge is, because it is the same answer to every challenge we faced before. Right? Every time people have come up with codes, systems, in order to judge themselves righteous, in order to be able to look at their actions and say, I'm one of the good people, I'm not like them, there's only ever been one answer to that. That answer has never been another code, or another set of laws. Now, that way of thinking that I mentioned before, the idea that, you know, that we need to value the law of God in a society where things are becoming increasingly lawless, I think the assumption behind that way of thinking is that the way to battle the new moralism is a resurgence of the old moralism. Like, have you ever heard people say things like, we need to get back to the old time religion? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know, but in the 50s, everything was perfect. We yeah. wouldn't have any of these problems. And if we could just get back to that, then everything would be fine. Like, we had a moralism that worked. And there were lots of good people. You could see them every Sunday if you went to church. 
And, and that's what we need to restore, if we could just get back to that. Or maybe you're, you're more historically inclined, and you realize the 1950s weren't a golden age. <laughs> the Reformation was a golden age. And if we could just get back to like 1549, everything would be perfect. And maybe you're thinking, no, that's not far enough. We need to go back to New Testament Christianity. If we could just get back to the rules of New Testament Christianity, then everything would be perfect. I wonder what Paul would think about that. And you read the epistles of Paul, and he's the guy who had to deal with the moralism of New Testament Christianity. Right? There wouldn't be a New Testament, at least half of it, if people weren't constantly wrong about right and wrong. If New Testament Christianity wasn't shot through with heresy and error, you wouldn't have needed the Bible. We've always had these problems. This struggle has always been there. There have always been moralisms, codes, and rules that we can embrace in order to assure ourselves that we're righteous. And the answer to those things has always been the same. It's always been grace. If a moralistic, puritanical, so-called Christian culture desperately needs to be reintroduced to the grace of Jesus Christ. To discover that church people aren't good people, that, that we weren't given the gospel because of our merit, so that we could go and share it with the sinners out there. If, if the whited sepulchers of religious institutions need grace, then the same thing is true for the new brand of moralists. The guy who wants to judge you because you don't live up to like his Christian moral code and condemn you as not a good person compared to him because you're not as Christian as he is, he's got the same problem as the guy who wants to judge the eggs you're eating or the non-sustainable fish that you grilled last weekend. It's the same root. It's the same desire. To, to find a way to make ourselves righteous. And the answer to that stuff is always grace. It's always that understanding that no code, no amount of good behavior is going to make us righteous. That it's impossible for us to, to be righteous by those means. Back to Terry Eagleton. We started with him and we're going to close with him. So Terry Eagleton is interesting because he is the guy, when I was in grad school, and you wanted to understand postmodern literary theory, they gave you his book. Like he was the guru of that stuff. But he isn't anymore because of his Christian faith. And so now when he writes about this stuff, he does it with a slightly different perspective. When he writes about Nietzsche saying, God is dead and we have killed him, Terry Eagleton doesn't get nervous. He says, Amen. Amen. He says there's a real irony to Nietzsche and, and his, his like, sense that, that if you think about the, the Nietzschean story, uh, God is killed, God dies, we are responsible for the death of God, and out of that needs to be reborn what Nietzsche calls the Superman, the Ubermensch, that's this sort of greater person on this higher spiritual level. Eagleton says it's really weird. Like Nietzsche doesn't seem to understand that that's, in a weird way, the Christian story. It says that the death of God involves the death of man along with the birth of a new form of humanity is orthodox Christian doctrine, a fact of which Nietzsche seems not to have been aware. For Christian faith, the death of God is not a question of his disappearance. On the contrary, it is one of the places where he is most fully present. Jesus is not man standing in for God. He is a sign that God is incarnate in human frailty and futility. Nietzsche thought, when he was celebrating the death of God, that he was like wiping away Christianity. What he was wiping away was, was so-called Christian moralism. But the gospel of grace had always been that God has died and we have killed him. The thing is, he didn't remain dead. Like he came back, he was raised from the dead. And it's because of the grace that we can have through that that we can be righteous. And it's nothing to do with our own work. There's no reason for us to be invested in the battle between the old moralism and the new moralism, between the old rules and the new rules. We can set that stuff aside. That's always been like a false battle. What we need to be faithful to is the gospel of grace, to be broken in the presence of the cross of Christ. One last quote. This is uh, 
Alexander Schmemann. He was a Russian Orthodox priest, and uh, I've been reading his journals recently. And he wrote something interesting that I think connects directly with this idea of old moralism versus new moralism. Now, both of these things are, are, are a blind alley. He says, Christianity is divided between conservatives longing for a religion of law and recompense and progressives serving a future happiness on this earth. What is interesting is that both groups hate nothing so much as a call to joy, as the reminding of a great joy announced and given at the beginning of the gospel, which is the life of Christianity. Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice, for which Christianity longs. Some say, how can one rejoice when millions are suffering? One must serve the world. That's this progressive idea of serving future happiness on this earth. Others say, how can one rejoice in a world lying in evil? That's that conservative idea. That we're longing for a religion of law and recompense where bad people get what's coming to them. They do not understand that if for just one minute that lasts secretly and hidden in the saints, the church has overcome the world. The victory was won through joy and happiness. The thing about law is that law is oppressive, that law clamps down on human joy and human happiness. The law of God is righteous and perfect. It reflects his character. But the use of the law is to bring us under condemnation, to show us how holy we are not. But there's no salvation, Paul says, in trying to keep the law. It's not possible for us to do that. The only salvation, the only righteousness available to us is the righteousness of Christ, which is only ours by grace. So the answer to every kind of moralism is to return to the foot of the cross, to stop worrying about whether or not we're good people, to stop trying to convince ourselves that we're good people compared to other people, but to embrace the idea that we're bad people in need of Christ's salvation. And the good news is we have it, that he's given it to us. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful to you that you give us strength in a world that is not our own, a world where we feel rightly that we're in a wilderness, that we are in exile. Lord, we ask that you wouldn't allow us to make ourselves too comfortable here, and that you also wouldn't allow us to be too uh, wrapped up in this world, to feel like we have to fight these, these silly moralistic battles to get in the way of your grace. But rather we ask, Lord, that you would always break us, that you would always give us a sense of our own unworthiness. But with that, a real joy at the forgiveness that we have by your grace. The joy that would make us lights in this new moralism, just as, as Christians have always been light in a world full of law. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. food, all the cookies are made with the uh, free-range chicken eggs. Yeah. Are they gluten-free?